Hi, Dr. Rob. Good evening, Ms. Dammy. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am ready to roll. I've been working with people all day. I'm ready to roll. Okay, so let's get started. Last time I asked about con con I'm sorry. Last time I asked about the conquest sex addict. Is that a level two sex addict? Is that the same as seductive addicts? Well, um, all addicts, all sex addicts are seductive in their own way. Um, we all have different ways of doing it. Some do it by being very sincere and honest and sweet. Some of it do it by being really aggressive. And, you know, there are all kinds of ways to be seductive. Um, I think that, and I also think that all sex addicts are in some level looking to, for acceptance and validation. So the idea of conquest is not just like what someone who's seeking a sexual conquest is looking for, like some 25 year old who just wants to get laid to prove that he's sexy or something. Sex addicts are looking for a lot more than that. In the conquest, they're looking for things that you really can't get from the experience of sex with a stranger or an affair. Like they're really looking for, am I important? Am I valid? Do you desire me? Am I important? So many of the needs that all sex addicts are really um, seeking to get when they act out sexually are not a problem. It's how they seek to get those needs met. Um, so whether you're a seductive or not seductive, whether you're a conquest or not, a, the, the point is, is that what you are trying to get from the person you act out with, which they can't give you, is a legitimate thing to get. It's just you can't get it by having sex with strangers or conquests. You can only get what we really want from this experience in intimate, meaningful, loving relationships with friends and family. And um, that's why they get stuck in this cycle because what they want, they can never really get. Thank you. And I don't know if there's any, would it be helpful to talk about level two sex addict? I mean, that's a term that I, you know, I don't think most people would hear or is well, that? I mean, um, there is a, when Pat Carnes wrote out of the shadows, he put people into different levels of addiction. And I'm not sure that we would really look at it in the same way now, because uh, for example, level three for him is uh, sexual offending. And, I don't think that sexual offending is necessarily, although it is for some people, an addictive behavior. So for some people, they're just offenders. And it's a power thing. It has nothing to do with addiction. So, um, But I think if you're pushing people in ways that they are not comfortable, that they don't want to be sexual, that they're really not interested in you, and you're pushing them, pushing them, pushing them, then yeah, there is a perpetrating piece to that that is a bit higher level in my mind than the person who's simply looking for someone who just wants to have sex with them. Um, if you're looking for that validation that only comes when someone doesn't want to have sex with you and you keep pushing them, then there is a perpetrator piece to that energy. I agree with that. Thank you for clarifying. So uh, the next question is, um, a, a successful independent females, we are love and sex addicts trying to move away from pathological narcissists. Are we intimidating the good men partners? If so, how? And how can we attract healthy, successful men? It seems that we look around and our male equivalents just want to rent out bimbos for the weekend. We, we don't want a bimbo down, but or we don't want to bimbo down. That almost sounds like limbo down, but bimbo down. No. But we do want to make sure that we are not sending off wrong vibes unbeknownst to us. So can you well, elaborate on that? I, I don't know if this is really a sex addiction question, but... I've heard from a lot of women who are friends and also colleagues that it seems to be very difficult right at this moment for intelligent, articulate, professional women to find their equal in a single man. And it does seem from what I'm hearing, like most of the people on the apps are really just looking for sex or really just looking for something short term or immediate. And so if you're out there really looking for something meaningful, it just seems hard, difficult to find somebody who isn't just looking for the short term. And I don't, I do not believe that this has to do with your level of intelligence, your level of um, clarity and your being a strong woman. Uh, I think it has to do with the fact that there's lots of players out there and you have to, it's really a minefield, I think, of to date. Dating is not like it was 15 years ago where you might have met somebody at a party and you knew their friends and, you know, dating today is all about apps and apps are a lot about anonymity, not knowing that person beyond what they have on the screen and what they said to you. So. It, and who is going to pick up the app and who is going to be engaging the app versus someone you might meet in the real world. So it's just, it's a difficult time, I think, to be single. Um, I run into young women um, in their 30s and late 20s who tell me they've never met anyone they didn't date on an app. 
And I think, oh my God, could you imagine being 30 years old and never having had anyone ask you out, not at a coffee shop, not at a library, but that's what a lot of young women tell me, that the only place they've been able to meet someone is on a, a dating app. Um, but, but the energy of apps in general is one of right now. You know, that's the thing. If I'm on Yelp looking for a restaurant, I'm probably looking for a restaurant for now. If I'm on, you know, if I'm online looking for, uh, to shop for dinner, I'm probably looking for a dinner right now. If I am uh, want to buy a gift, it's probably not for next year. I'm online for a gift I need now. And so if I'm online looking for romance, well, that's kind of a long-term thing, but being online hooking up with people is a short-term thing. So the system is not set up in your favor, ladies. Um, it really is set up for long-term, non-intimate interactions. And the best way that you can find yourself with the right person, and I hate to say this because it sounds so much like grandma, is by not having sex with people. Because number one, women, by uh, biological nature, when you start having sex with us males, you will start to bond with us. That's part of your biology. And so it makes it harder for you to see the healthy person from the non-healthy person. And in addition to that, um, it takes a long time to get to know somebody. And I, I do want to say that in our culture of immediacy, I remember a couple of years ago, a therapist said to me, oh, you know, well, actually, this is about 20 years ago. He said to me, um, I said, how long does it take to meet someone you might marry? And he said, about two years. And I just wanted to rip his throat out. I was like, what do you mean two years? He's like, well, it takes about two years to really get to know someone to really, you know, and I think that we kind of want that to happen faster. And it just doesn't. Um, you can get into sex and intensity and romance really quickly, but meaningful connection with someone who has substance, that takes time. It takes time to build that and it takes time to find that. So no, I will not put you down or devalue you for your uh, being an intelligent, dr you know, driven businesswoman professional. Good for you. Um, I do think, however, if you're not a bimbo and you're not looking to be a player, that your field is going to be more narrow, especially in the internet world of dating as it is today. So good hunting. <laughs> and listen, if you can go to, the more you can go to parties, the more you can join a club, the more you can start volunteering, the more opportunities you have meet, to meet people in real time and see how they act in the world, not in a coffee shop on your first date, but when they're licking envelopes volunteering, that's probably going to be the better place for you to meet somebody, but hey, who has time, right? Well, yeah, but if I'm doing the things that I really want to do anyway, then I'm doing things I want to do and I meet people who are like-minded. So, so it does help, you know, I'm, that's, it worked for me. So, okay. You tell um, me. I know, I couldn't resist. Do tell you me have some ideas? relationships right here. So, do you have any ideas about, no, let's see. Do you have ideas about sex porn addiction among people who have experienced trauma as teenagers? I am a gay man and I lost my father to an accidental death at age 13. I am so sorry. I remember you talking with Noah Church about different treatment for those who experienced very young childhood trauma versus those who do not, but who became addicted to porn at a time when the internet exploded with it. Oops, hang on. It just slid. I got it. Yes. Um, I feel like I may be somewhere in between. So, and thanks for all the amazing work you're doing. Sure. Um, so let me see how to address this. Um, I know, Tammy, when you look at them, you they're gone and I can't see them anymore. So No. Oh, I, I, it should be at the top. I just put it on. That's okay. Um, so I need you to ask it again. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you or have ideas about mind. sex and porn addiction among people who have experienced oh, right. okay. teenagers? teenagers? Lo so, lost, lost his father at age 13 and thinks might be in, in between those who came, um, yeah. became porn addicted when the internet exploded and those experienced trauma. You know, that sounds right to me and I would trust yourself in the sense that, you know, most folks, so um, there was a time pre-internet and pre-porn on the internet when most of the people that we saw, in fact, all of them, and sex addiction treatment were people who had early complex trauma, uh, abuse, neglect, mental illness, alcoholism, problems in the family that they grew up in before they were five years old. What we've seen since the escalation of porn use and online um, imagery is that people at later age, ages are finding themselves drawn to the sexual content, which by the way, any 13 or 14 year old would be, but it becomes a substitute for uh, connecting to people. And if you're in grief or you're in a trauma and you don't resolve it by working through it with people, but you work resolve it by staring at porn, you haven't resolved it. 
So there are lots of people who, there are people who turn later life trauma, like adolescent trauma, into compulsive behavior, but it has a little bit of a different feel to it. And I think you're just speaking to that, which is, yes, there was trauma, but there was the porn to make me feel better, to distract me, to uh, give me a place to go. And, and so maybe there's parts of that trauma that I really have never worked through, and parts of me are still 12 or 13 years old, and that would make a lot of sense. But here's the thing, you know, I do suggest that um, those of us who started um, fairly early, um, it's going to be with us a lifetime. It's not like the desire to escape through sex is going to go away. Um, but the earlier it happened, my belief is, and I seem to, I think I'm pretty right about this, the earlier abuse, the earlier the losses in life, the more compulsive you're going to be, the more driven the problem is going to be. So the person who had major trauma at 13 that went unresolved is going, or went into the porn, is going to have a slightly easier time of that work than someone who had a mentally ill mother who wasn't there for her when she was five. Different, different, but similar. Thank you. You're welcome. So I am the betrayed partner. Discovery was 10 months ago. Husband is sober for 10 months. Lots of ups and downs, but we both want the relationship and stay together. He is in a 12-step program and sees a CSAT trained therapist. I requested safety needs to be in place eight months ago and have um, consistently asked for that with him in front of his therapist and in front of our therapist. It's been a struggle for him to be consistent. And by that, I mean, he does two times out of 10 times and continues to get angry that I am controlling and nothing he does is good enough. He is sober. What else do I want from him? With therapy and Lifestar Group, I place boundaries and the consequences have been withdrawal from my part to work on my healing and self-care. He is mad and confused the last three months to why I am angry and detached. He now complains and gets angry that I am not a safe place for him to be vulnerable and to be honest and forthcoming. He tells me he will only do that when I become a safe place. Do oh. we know how long this has been going? Like how long has the person been sober or working it's on this? 10 months, 10 months in recovery. So they had discovery 10 months ago, been sober 10 months. So has been working on that. So, but the last three months have been. So uh, here's uh, some thoughts. Um, one is I wrote a book about this. Um, it's called Out of the Doghouse, um, a relationship saving guide for men caught cheating. Um, if you want to have me earn 12 cents, please go buy a copy of Out of the Doghouse. That's about what I earn on the book sales. But um, okay, so he read it. So I was saying this to a friend. I was at a conference recently and I said, I have not met many men who can read that book and not be emotionally affected by it. Um, and if a man isn't emotionally affected by, affected by it, that I find disturbing. Um, because even men who are deeply caught up in their own self-obsession and pain can read a book like that and say, wow, I think I understand what she's gone through and what I need to do to make it better. So my question is, if he read out of the doghouse, which very clearly says how he needs to act around you in order to begin to heal the wound, why is he not doing it? Is, in other words, does he not have the emotional capacity? Is he just too upset, too depressed to really try to engage you in a healthier way? Is he so angry at you that he's unwilling to? And I guess, where's the empathy? Like you didn't have the affair, he did. You didn't act out, he did. You, so it is, so Out of the Doghouse is a book that shows on the cover a man in the doghouse, like in the little doghouse with the bone and everything. And the purpose is that for the man to understand that he is no longer your equal in the relationship, that he is one down that you don't trust him, that you aren't going to feel safe around him, that you are going to be suspicious and you aren't the ultimate safe space that he wants. You're not there to be his mother. You're there to be his wife. And as I often say, you know, a guy will go to 12-step programs and get a chip. He'll go to his uh, therapy group and everyone will cheer because he's got six months sober. And we are really happy for him and he really needs that. But then he goes home to you and you, he says he was six months sober and you say, well, that's great, but you were cheating for 11 years of our marriage. And you're right meaning that it is not a spouse's job to be the primary or even maybe the secondary source of support in a relationship where you are the one who's been cheated on. Yes, you want to put your relationship in some kind of safe harbor or place where you can rest it while you go through your anger and hurt, while he goes through his disclosures and his, but there should, so it's sad to me that there's not empathy for you and that you're not experiencing that. The only other thing I want to say about it is Oh, but if he's willing to do anything, send him to treatment because I'll come kick his butt <laughs> about this. 
because I'm really good at helping men understand how they have failed their responsibilities to their family in a way that doesn't make them feel ashamed, but they get it. Um, Read the rest of this. It says he's willing to do anything, but physically says his job is recovery, not work on the relationship. He also says it's not fair that I get to do things, that she gets to do things, and he doesn't. I don't tell him everything, but he he tells me everything. So um, I will give a caveat to what I've been saying, which is this, um, because I have to be fair to the sex addicts. It's not unusual for a spouse who's been wounded and hurt and betrayed and lied to, to feel like, you know what? Now it's my turn. Now I don't just want you to stop acting out with women. I want you to be attentive, engaged, uh, not narcissistic, you know, sympathetic, um, uh, supportive, involved, curious, and warm. And the truth is, if he wasn't warm, supportive, engaging, and for, you know, all that before, he's not going to be that now because he's sober. Sobriety is just stopping the behavior. But what it takes to become a caring, intimate, loving partner often means more time, more therapy, and more self-examination than simply stopping the behavior and being in a 12-step program or going to some therapy. So what I'm saying to you is what you want is perfectly reasonable and understandable, and who wouldn't? but I don't know that he's capable of giving it. I don't know if he'll ever be capable of giving it. What you're seeing is the real guy here. You know, the guy, the, un, the, un, the, the, the one who hasn't been drinking from the Kool-Aid, the one who is just who he is. And whether he ends up over time becoming a more caring, more engaged, more supportive partner is really up to him and not up to you. And I think that's the most important thing for me to say. Your job in the first year is to be angry, hurt, disappointed, overwhelmed and to figure out if you even want to stay with this guy. That's your job. Um, your job is not to be kind, loving, nurturing, and, and attentive to all of his pain. You're in pain. He needs someone to be kind, attentive, and nurturing to his pain. That's why he should be in therapy and 12-step programs so the people who aren't angry at him, him, the people who he hasn't hurt, can support him. But you should be angry at him and you have been hurt by him and it's not your job to be a nurturing, loving mother to this man. And by the way, it does sound that's what like what he's looking for. I hear mom, not wife, mom. Why can't you be more like a mom? Moms forgive you when you make mistakes and kiss your boo-boos and, you know, and that's because you can't really betray a mother in the same way that you could betray a wife or a husband. Um, and it does sound like he wants more of a mom and that's not your job, nor has it ever been. She adds, he was so much more of that before discovery and now he's horrible. And, you know, and, and so I keep thinking, you know, he's in the in-between. He doesn't have enough recovery tools. So even though he's in recovery, he, here's a, a, a whole bunch of things. I just told somebody earlier today, there's the warming of the chair at the meeting. So you can go to a meeting and you can have the, you know, I'm here and I'm, I'm doing recovery and you can, you can fake it basically you can do whatever or you can you know give little you know I'm, I'm I'm doing this and I'm you know here's all the things I'm doing and then you go home and they don't see you so you can not get recovery the other thing is if you've been acting out for a really long time you don't have coping skills to cope with life so he was he had those coping skills that let him be a nicer person and now those coping skills have been removed so now he's stuck with the I don't know what to do and he you know he doesn't have enough skills to be a nicer person in my world, yes, I'd send him off to Seeking Integrity and have Rob help him learn tools, but whatever. But anyway, so for you, um, because she said uh, he was, oh, that's another person. I got to stay focused. So so for you, um, you know, it is really challenging because you're like, I got Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and he was nicer before he got into recovery. So what happened? So Well, it, what happened is he's feeling all of his feelings, and mm -hmm. he doesn't have any place to escape, and he is struggling to keep his own stability. And for that, I might say, by the way, I sort of wonder, and as I often do, is he depressed? You know, does he, it's not unusual for, and there's a great book called, uh, I love this book called, um, called um, give me, uh, I Don't Want to Talk About It is the name of the book. I Don't Want to Talk About It. And it's by a man named Terry Real. And he, this book is about sort of male depression. And it really speaks to how male depression often comes out as irritability, acting out, um, 
rage, a lack of empathy, impulsivity, that men in general often um, show depression not as crying and sad and lying in bed, but we tend to more act out our depression or anxiety. So I would also consider or ask him to consider that maybe underneath that addiction are some emotional health issues. Because if he's coming home depressed and anxious and he's got a lot of stuff running inside of him, then he's not going to be available to you. He's going to be preoccupied. And it may well, it may well be that an evaluation for meds or psychiatrist would be useful. Okay. Wow, lots of bells going on I would here. say that, I think that's all on you because I don't think I'm doing that. So I'll turn my but, bells off. Okay. No, that's okay. Um, so the next question, I'm a love addict and I'm noticing myself clinging to my partner more than, at the, more than the beginning of a relationship. For example, he started a job after a month off and I long for him. This happens when he goes to the gym or store. I thought I moved away from this feeling after years in the program. How do I stay in recovery behavior? Will this obsession come and go in recovery? Okay. Okay. So I think that um, um, we always have to work a program around things like this, especially when we find ourselves. So here's a way of thinking about it. Um, if I, if I'm really hungry and, and there's not a single restaurant in sight, and there's no food around, I probably eventually will stop being hungry. Um, but if I'm really hungry and I can smell fried chicken, I'm going to be really hungry for a while. It's just going to, I'm going to want some of that fried chicken. And so when you open yourself up to loving someone and you really open yourself to being vulnerable, all these wonderful things we hear about, intimacy, vulnerability, you're going to find that not only does do the needs that you have of this relationship in this moment come up, but it's very likely that all the needs you've ever had of any relationship are going to come up and they're all going to be shining, staring you in the face. And that's why sometimes we can overly engage with people we don't know it that well or get stuck in relationships we don't belong in because our needfulness is so great that we will just choose the first person that comes along or the second. And if they're reasonably nice and we don't see, we just sort of go forward and we don't necessarily look around to make sure that they're the healthiest, sanest, most supportive person in the world. So um, what I would say is coming up for you is a sense of needfulness, a sense of longing, a sense of loneliness. And it could be a couple of things. He might have been doing things to leave you feeling that he's more distant and you're not even really paying attention to them because you're more focused on your feelings. Or maybe there's something going on in your life. Someone died, something happened, a job, whatever, and it leaves you feeling more needful than normal. And so of course you're looking longingly at your partner for that. Um, these, you, by the way, you know the answer to the question, which is yes, your obsession will come and go during your recovery you should be in meetings. You should have a sponsor just because you, you know, I remember in early recovery, I thought, good, once my, I know my sex addiction is going to be all over once I'm married, because once I'm married, I'm not going to do that anymore. And all the issues are going to be gone. Well, guess what? <laughs> that isn't true. Um, marriage just brought up a whole different set of issues around how I get my needs met and how I feel about myself emotionally. And so your needfulness, first of all, don't, I, I strongly discourage you from making yourself wrong. Um, if you're feeling needful of more love, more affection, if you're turning to him more than you feel comfortable or feels even a little obsessional to you, all that means is you're needful. Acting on it is a problem. So desperately chasing him, finding somebody else, acting out, that's a problem. But the needfulness is a really difficult thing to hold on to, but a really important thing to know you're feeling. And you will get your needfulness met by going to some SLAA meetings, calling your sponsor, getting in group, and, you know, especially if your spouse is not around. So, um, by the way, you said he started a job after a month off and I longed for him. Well, guess what? Not that long ago, I wasn't working and I was at home all the time and my husband was home all the time. And then he went and got a job and I really wanted him to go to work. But boy, when I was sitting around a home, a home alone, I really missed him. And it was really hard for me to be alone after he was around for so long. That's healthy. The question is, how do you deal with it? How do you tolerate and manage and get this need met without making him crazy or yourself? Um, and the answer is, you know, they're already here in front of you. They're people like us. Um, so hopefully that helps. Okay. Next question. I would like to know how I can determine if my partner is gay or bisexual or not. I have seen him with pictures of penises on his phone. He's in a group chat. 
Um, actually, this one kind of continues the same thing. How do I know? Um, uh, I've never caught him with another man, but he watches gay porn. He watches videos of males jerking off. He's in a chat room. Um, videos. He's unwilling to speak to me because he says, I went search for things and I find it. Um, oh I, sh I should deal with it. He should. He says he feels violated oh. because I went through his emails. They've been together for 15 years and have uh, several children. Okay, so I'm going to call you T because I know your first initial is T. And uh -huh. let me tell you this, T. Your husband is an asshole. Let me be really direct about this. Your husband is a jerk, okay? Meaning that you have every right to look through his email if you believe that he's been unfaithful to you. Now, if he's been faithful and you've been, have a trusting relationship and you have absolutely no reason to suspect anything, then really you don't have any right, none of us have any right to go through our partner's personal things and personal emails and you know go into their coded stuff online and that's their business. But once trust has been breached, once he has shown you that he will lie to you, that he will keep secrets from you, that he will run a bunch of stuff that you don't know about, hoping you won't find it, then all bets are off. So the reason I say your husband is an asshole, pardon my language, Tammy hates it when I curse, but I get angry at men like this because you're the ones who's been violated, not him. You, he violated you with his secrecy, with his sex with other men online, with who knows whatever else he's doing and keeping that secret from you. And when you find out about it, your anger, your curiosity, your desire to know where you stand you know, with him is perfectly normal. And if he's pushing you away because you now want to know more, um, that is his desire for you to not find out more. In other words, him saying to you, you've invaded my space and therefore you know, I'm angry is just him being a big fat liar because what he's really saying, trying to do is keep you out of what he wants to do, which is keep secrets from you and act out. Um, now, I could be wrong. He could be a really lovely man and you're just a crazy wife, but I don't think so. And let me tell you this, men who um, watch gay porn, watch videos of other men jacking off, go into chat rooms with men and send penises are not necessarily entirely straight. So I don't know whether he's gay or straight, I don't know whether he's gay or bi, but men who are pursuing sex with other men are not what I would call straight. So yes, he has an active, so here's my answer to you. Your husband has an active sex life with men. It's online and maybe in real life. How do you feel about that? What does that mean to you? And what are you gonna do about it? That is really the reality. But the fact that he doesn't want you to look anymore or he feels offended because you looked when clearly you have every reason to look, that's him being a jerk. So there's one in the chat we're gonna pick up. My essay husband says he was numbed out during acting out as if watching, not participating. Is this dissociative? Is this typical? Which comes first, dissociation or addiction? That's a great question. So dissociation comes first because we learned dissociation when we we're little babies. Um, first of all, all of us dissociate. Healthy people dissociate, we space out. Every one of us has, you know, I mean, even if you forgot where you left your keys, it's sort of a form of dissociation. They're over there in your head somewhere, but you can't remember where you put them. Um, if you're driving down the freeway and you miss an exit because you were thinking about the, something, you're dissociating. So dissociation is a, a healthy part of how human beings tolerate stress and uh, overwhelm as we just kind of space out. And, and you could say the TV is an ultimate place to dissociate. But um, so when, when children have abuse, when children are violated, when children experience neglect, you know, your average four-year-old is not going to stand up and say, well, mom, you got to stop drinking and dad, you got to stop hitting mom because I feel unsafe. You know, your average four-year-old just simply spaces out and goes off into fantasy because they need some safe place to go in their heads when things aren't safe at home. And that learned experience of using dissociation and fantasy to soothe myself and calm myself when I'm stressed out happens fairly early in life. The degree to which the child needs to dissociate in order to feel okay is often directly related to how much stress they're under and how much pain is going on. So, you know, dissociation is healthy. Dissociation when you're acting out is really what acting out is. It is a dissociative act, meaning when you go into the fantasy around sexual acting out, you're starting to dissociate. When you're fully in the act, you're pretty dissociated. I'm not thinking about my wife, my family, my friends, my life, all that goes somewhere else. All I'm thinking about is the, the body in front of me and the sex I'm having. And that's really the goal. I know how hard it is. I really do know how hard it is for you partners when you've been betrayed. 
I don't think there's a way I can explain to you that it's not about you. It affects you, but it's not about you. We don't do this because we're not happy in our relationship or because uh, you've gained weight or because we do it because we are emotionally charged in ways that we can't tolerate and we take this charge somewhere else to, to discharge it. We don't turn to you and say, I'm hurting, I'm hungry, I'm, I'm sad. We turn to strangers to release that energy because we don't feel safe inside of ourselves. So um, I think that, what was I gonna say to all this? So um, be kind to yourself. <laughs> It's a long process and yes, dissociation is part of it. Dissociation is acting out and dissociation is learned in, in really infancy and early childhood. So the next question, inquiring as a loved one of a sex addict, we've been down this road a handful of times during our relationship over the past three years. The last one was the breaking point to decide if we would continue to be in a relationship or not as we are to be married in four months. One thing that I have brought up to him that concerns me is his sexual fantasy affairs happened with one of his female best friends of 10 plus years multiple times during our relationship. I have spoken to both of them together and separately to let them know that it made me feel very uncomfortable and very disrespected. They live about 800 miles away from the affair partner. As of this last offense, I had asked that he please remove all relationships, phone numbers, and people from his contacts, social media, and his life. This is the one sexual fantasy affair that he is refusing to give up because it was a friendship at first. Any suggestions? This is the one thing that seems to keep repeating in my head and makes me angry out of nowhere. Well, I'm really glad you asked, and I really am glad you're paying attention to that anger because it's justified. You have every reason to be angry. This man is saying, I want to commit my life to you, but except for this girl, I want to keep talking to. And that is not okay. Um, so part of what men don't understand when they cheat is that they lose um, the ability to call the shots. Men really, we really like to call the shots. And ladies, sometimes I have to say, you let us, even though you know we're stupid, you let us call the shots because you know who's really in control, which is often you. Um, but it is not okay. It is, and, and so you have, but you have every right to say, um, you had a, a relationship with this woman you had a sexual relationship with this woman and I don't want you to be in touch with her any longer because I don't trust her and I don't trust you. The answer to that question or that your request, there's only one answer to that on his part. Absolutely, honey, I completely understand how you wouldn't trust me. And as much as I feel that I, this is gonna be a loss for me, I have earned this loss because I'm not trustworthy with her and I have broken your trust with her and therefore I have a loss. Behaviors have consequences. If he, wants to marry you, he's going to have to show some understanding that, that you need to feel safe. And it doesn't matter how important that friendship is to him. He screwed it when he started screwing her. And that means that he doesn't get to have it anymore. And it doesn't mean that she isn't a good person or she doesn't deserve to have this friend. Or It's simply that he's marrying you. And you don't feel comfortable with this. And you have every right to not feel comfortable with this. Why is this man's priority to maintain the relationship with this other woman instead of supporting you. That's what I want to know. Because if he's going to marry you, you're the one who is his priority. And you're the one he has to say, absolutely, honey, whatever makes you feel safe. And if he's not doing that, I got to wonder if I really want to get married to somebody who's more committed to staying in touch with the next girlfriend than respecting me. So girlfriend, I'm on your side, but I don't like what I'm hearing. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to answer a question in general. Uh, for someone somebody was talking about how to watch these after the fact these are being recorded there are um, a number of them that are recorded John Taylor did a great one um, uh, uh, earlier today and those will be added to the sex and relationship healing.com website so you can go to previously recorded webinars and you you will see those and then they go to YouTube after a series of um, I think after about four weeks, then they are just on YouTube, but you can find those. So if you heard something and you thought, well, did I hear what I think I heard? Right. Or if you want someone to listen to it, like- yeah, I'd like my question. husband to hear what he yes, had to exactly. say. Exactly, that's exactly why I'm saying it. So, so yes, you will be able to see this. This one will probably get uploaded tomorrow. Um, um, but you'll, it will be on there if not tomorrow, the next day, but you know, they're constantly getting updated. So they are available as a resource. There's a great podcast. I want to throw that in too. A lot of people are really valuing the podcast that you've done. 
um, and continue to do. And so there's a lot of great information that, you know, if they won't watch a webinar, maybe they'll listen to a podcast, you know. The so. podcast is called Sex, Love, and Addiction. And you can find it on Stitcher, or iTunes. Or, and, you know, it's a great thing to advertise because it's free. So, you know, put it on the car. I, I have some of, I believe, some of the more distinguished experts in the country around intimacy, relationships, parenting, healing, infidelity. And I'm just asking them the questions, and they've been kind enough to answer them. Um, and there's some really good podcasts there. So, yeah, they you are. should check that out. Yeah. We'd love to have you do that. Yeah, and you can find them on sexandrelationshiphealing.com too. There's a, you can click through on that as well. So I, I wanted to tell me to say something about, um, there's a question a woman asked earlier, and I just wanted to respond to a little bit more of it. Okay. It's just a question about my essay husband says he's numbed out during acting out as if he's almost watching and not participating. Is this dissociative? And so one of the things we teach clients when they come into treatment or we or in my books and all that is, that that feeling of being numbed out or being in a bubble or feeling like you're in a trance is very common for people who are acting out. And what it means is that, you know, let me further explain what a dissociative state is. So these folks are so high on their own neurochemistry, meaning adrenaline, endorphins, oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine. They're so excited, so aroused, so mood influenced. Their heart is pounding, their pupils are dilated. When they're in these situations, you know, seeing the prostitute, having sex behind the backwoods, whatever, this person is not present. They are almost like in a fight or flight state. Like they're just in this incredible intensity and, and that is not a healthy um, normative state. I mean, that is a specific state of consciousness that is there to help them escape emotionally. Um, so yes, they are numb to anything that isn't right in front of them. And that is dissociate, dissociative, yeah. Okay, so I found out my husband's 30 year porn addiction and excessive masturbation seven months ago after being made for 29 years, made, married I think. He was exposed as a 10 year old um, child. He says he was given, uh, he says he has given up porn but I don't know what to believe anymore as he is still defensive and doesn't seem to understand what I am feeling. He just now had an STD test, which came back positive for herpes too, and expects me to trust him uh, that it is a false positive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I do not know how to trust him at all anymore. I feel like we have lost everything. I don't know what to do. And he is not here for me emotionally and shows little empathy when he hurts me. How do I know if he truly is in recovery since he used porn and masturbation at the workplace? I can't heal from the betrayal thinking he is still hurting me. We are not making any progress repairing our marriage. Any advice? Yeah, I do have advice. Um, join our drop-in group for women who are experiencing betrayal because you're not the, you may not be able to get him to move, but just to hear other women talking about their stuckness or how they got a little further with their spouse or, you know, just not being alone with this and being around other women who are being cheated on and lied to is incredibly powerful. And we set that up, you know, I, we don't even do treatment for spouses. We set it up because we knew that you guys would, that you guys naturally gravitate toward each other in terms of comfort and support. I know how embarrassing it is to get online and talk about having been cheated on. Um, but when you're talking to a room full of people who've been cheated on, it isn't so embarrassing. It's more comforting. And I think that if you plug into people who will love you through this and will support you through this, like therapy, like 12 step support groups, like uh, drop in groups, you know, you may not get it from him, but you don't, what you need, you can get, you can get support. You can get love. I love you. I'm sorry. You're in this situation and I want you to get the support you need. Your husband may or may not be able to give it to you. He may or may not ever be able to give it to you, but you deserve support, nurturing, and love. So if he can't give it to you at least now or who knows in the future, go find it. Um, go find other women who have experienced this pain and have worked their way through it. You will too. Um, it is hard for me, I have to say, and I want to say this with Tammy present. When we get people who've been married 25 years, 28 years, 30 years, 23 years, you know, and they say that they just found out X, Y, Z, it is really devastating. You know, I, I obviously work with couples who, you know, are new to the table, they're newly getting together. I've worked with couples that have known all along or found out early in their relationship, but I have a special place in my heart for you spouses who, especially women, in my opinion, who thought you were 
married to this and thought you had that and thought you knew what your life was about and thought you were on a particular path with this person. And then to suddenly find out that not only are you not on the same path and not only are they going a different way, but they've been doing that for 20 years. I can't tell you how painful that is and how much empathy I have for you and how I wish that you don't go through that alone. And if he's not willing to own his shit and man up around it, then you need to find some people who will support you. In fact, you need to find people to support you anyway. So, um, and yeah, I am so sorry that these men have not had the courage to say to you, I'm broken and this is my brokenness and I want you to know about it because you have a right to know that. What is the point of being married if you don't know your, about your husband or wife's pain and how they're dealing with it? I'm so sorry. So somebody else who's in this group just um, sent a message saying, I'm 30 years married, overwhelmed by grief, just found out. And she uh, talked about Angela Spearman's Sunday night group. And Angela Spearman happens to be online with us tonight too. So I've heard really good things about that. And other, you know, there's a 1230 um, Wednesday, uh, 1230 PM Wednesday Pacific time. There's a, a group for partners. So th there are more resources. I'd invite you to do that, but um, you are not alone and, and do not trust them. It's not a false positive. And um, uh, yeah, he, you know, after 30 years of porn addiction, after seven months, he's not going to be all fixed. I can tell you that. So. And by the way, if he has herpes too, then you need to go to the doctor. Uh, herpes from men, um, you know, uh, can produce real serious problems, including the possibility of cervical cancer in a woman. So I want you to really make sure your health checks out and you get the help you need. Um, by the way, are you looking for HPV? Are you looking for chlamydia? And, and I guess I want to know, you know, you just talked about porn, but how did he get the H, how did he get the herpes? Exactly. Um, and if he's got herpes, what else has he got? And where else has he been? And so all the trust goes out the window now, and you have to treat him like a stranger, unfortunately, so you can protect yourself. And that's just how it is. So Angela just said, yes, please join us. You're welcome in our drop-in group. And somebody else said, um, 16 years married, same thing here, found out um, after 10 months. So there's lots of you. That's why you're here. Thank you for being here. Okay, so next question. Um, I am a partner. My husband has only been sober for less than a week. We are in crisis. We have two kids, my stepkids, and I'm terrified to lose them. And I'm really not sure he's truly ready to heal. He's doing an intensive trauma therapy for the next day, two days with his therapist, but I'm not seeing plans for 12 step program or anything. I'm not willing to stay if he's really not going to take this on because we have gone through this now four times over the last six and a half years and he's um, been unable to stay sober and has lied to me directly over and over again. So I'm wondering, go ahead. I actually can comment already. I think, okay. If you don't mind. So Tammy, uh, so uh, give me an initial for this person. Uh, let's use uh, A. So A, here's what I recommend. Write Tammy a note here now or later and say, I not sure if my husband's getting the help he needs with the person he's seeing, but I want to make sure that I get the help we need. And can you help me find someone who really knows how to do this work where I live? Because if you get yourself connected to a therapist who knows how to do this work, who's trained in doing this work, then whether his therapist gets it or not, you will slowly be pulled into the process. And so will he. Um, I agree with you as a therapist who does this work now, 25, 28 years that I don't think I'd be doing intensive trauma work with anybody who was acting out. And I'll tell you why. Um, sexual acting out, like drinking, like using, like gambling, all of this is an impulse disorder in a sense. We get impulsive and compulsive around this behavior when we're feeling out of control or uh, emotions that we don't know how to tolerate. So going to do trauma work looking at the past in an intensive way, well, what would that do? It would bring up lots of deep and problematic feelings for somebody. If they already are acting out when they have a difficulty with you or have a bad night or drop a pencil, in other words, if they don't have the ability to contain their acting out with the emotional life they currently have, there's no way that trauma work is gonna support that person because they're already an empty sieve. You're just pouring water. In other words, the way we work is we ask people to learn how to contain the behavior first. And by building that container with support from 12-step therapy, treatment, whatever it is, then 
maybe six months or a year in when that person is no longer acting out, then it's time to look at trauma because then that person has support from friends, they've worked through hopefully the crisis in their relationship, and they're on a more stable ground with lots of support to start looking at trauma. But I would never personally as a therapist bring somebody into trauma work or intensives um, unless they were very specific to an addiction once an addiction has been discovered because that's the only work that's really useful. So I am concerned along with you. And, you know, I think the only thing you can do if, you know, you can question the therapy, but we don't know, I don't know enough about it. You can go to the therapy, but honestly, I think the best thing you could do is find somebody you could see and get some support so that you can begin to understand what makes sense and what doesn't for you. And you have support regardless of what he's doing with his either useful or useless therapist. Okay, so um, I'm going to cut over to the chat. There's is the 6 p.m. Sunday group for partners uh, learning to live with an addict. Um, so that's a drop-in group that Angela hosts, and it's a, it's it's a pro dependence. So if you haven't heard about the book, what, Rob, why don't you give a little? Well, first of all, let me say the drop-in groups are different than this. Correct. Meaning you're all going to see each other if you want to, or at least you're going to be in the room and I'm going to cover my camera now. So I could be in a drop-in group and just show this and not actually show my face. But the idea of the drop-in group is so that you can drop in and interact with other people. So this particular Q&A is set up so that you have complete privacy and questions are being answered. But the drop-in groups are for you to get support and to see face-to-face -face other women or men or whatever group you're in dealing with the issues you're dealing with. And all our drop-in groups are monitored by professionals. We um, we either have volunteers or very lightly paid therapists who help us out. And the goal here is we want to we want to give some of this away. I understand what a mystery all of this is. I understand how easy it is. I think for spouses to buy into a line of BS from us sex addicts. And so I want to keep the playing field clear by giving you information and support. Even if you never make therapy, even if you never make a 12 step program, you can get this kind of help here. And we've got 15 groups a week going on sex and relationship healing. There is no charge for any of it. So please take advantage. And those drop in groups will help you enormously. And if you're looking for help from a therapist and you want to find the right one, we know people all over the country and we don't get kickbacks. We just give the referrals to the people we respect and who are doing good work. So write us. So Angela adds about half have been keeping their cameras covered and half are openly facing each other. So everyone's presence That's is fine. felt and valued. When you mentioned learning to live with an addict, I think a lot of it is it's learning to, uh, to find support for yourself in having to deal with an addict. So, so it isn't like that now you have to stay with the addict or go or whatever. There's, yeah. it's always, you get to choose, but it's support and, and clarifying, you know, like we're talking about validating your experiences. So, so, you know, someone asked a question, we're like, you're right. You, you know, listen to your, you know, listen to that. Your gut. And I've seen people yeah. down there say, thank you. I feel better. Right. Yeah. This is what we want you to have. <laughs> exactly. So, so go, there's no charge. Go drop in, check them out. There's lots of um, different opportunities and see if it's a fit for you. So next question. In my SAA group, many people talk about how they will always be a recovering addict. I feel inside that I don't always have to be an addict. I feel that I can recover fully from my addiction. I've heard this sentiment echoed in other porn addicts, including some of the speakers you've had on your podcast. So is there a matter of semantics? Oh, so is it a matter of semantics? Can people actually recover, yeah. have, have some kind of awakening and completely heal as if they have a new chapter of life? Um. So this is a mixed answer because that's a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, this will never leave your life in the sense that you lived through it, you did it, it it's, you've experienced it, you, you've had pain from it. And, you know, it's not going to go, the, the, the memory is not going to go away. The feeling of it is not going to go away. But the question you're asking, I think, is, well, I always feel compelled to act out. Is that going to go away? Will this desire to disappear, to associate it to sex and fantasy go away? Or will I always feel compelled to do that? And the answer is yes and no. <laughs> because we have different kinds of sex addicts. So we have sex addicts who have early complex trauma or mid-adolescent, mid early childhood trauma, and they pretty much struggle all their lives. Because my brain, I had a mentally ill mom, I had a lot of abuse and abandonment. My brain, when it should have been, and I'm pointing to the back of my brain, because that's what's growing when you're little, um, when my brain should have been growing toward trust and you know, contentment and play, 
unfortunately, that wasn't the environment I grew up in. My environment I grew up in was one of stress and fear and anxiety. So I learned how to read people, how to tolerate things, how to manage difficult circumstances. I'm not sure I ever learned how to have fun or to be a relaxed child. And as a result, I will struggle all of my life with this as I do with the desire. It's never gone away. If I have a bad day, it occurs to me. It doesn't mean I have to go do it, but it will always be with me. However, we do have a different population of young men and women who are addicted to porn. And it seems that for them, they didn't necessarily all of them have early complex trauma or compelling reasons in early childhood that drive them to escape into porn. Some of you, we are learning, um, are simply porn addicts, meaning you might have started 13, 14, 12, whenever, and the porn became a go-to. It was more fun than trying to go out on a date. It was more fun than trying to join the team. It was more fun than, and before you know it, you're 20, and all you've done is look at porn. You haven't gone out, you haven't dated, you haven't you know, been on a team, you've really been isolated with the porn. And for those porn addicts who did not start out with early life trauma, but seem to have more of a, what we would call conditioned response to the porn that started in early adolescence, it does seem to be true that um, you guys, when you put down the porn fully and you start to engage in really fulfilling life circumstances with people, like being on a team or, you know, being part of a group or going to church or dating or once you start enjoying your lives, it seems that for many porn addicts, the desire and the compulsion goes away. So, and I think this has to do with the fact that it is more of a, what we call a conditioned response. It's something that at 13, 12, 14 became your norm, your go-to, and you did it for a really long time but it's not gonna be burned into your brain in the same way that dissociation and fantasy as a means of self-soothing are burned into my brain because I had no safe place to go when I was two. Um, you probably had a safe place to go when you were two and three and four and five and maybe at 14 got hooked on porn. You are not necessarily gonna have the same struggles that I will have all my life with the desire to act out or emotional challenges because you had a more stable upbringing than me and the porn kind of gotcha uh, with the trauma of adolescence, if you will, but not with the trauma of having a mentally ill mother or an alcoholic dad at two. So yes, I think the later that the injuries occur that lead you to using the compulsive behavior, the later in life, um, the, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to move away from them and not return to them. Um, and if you started looking at porn and escaping at 13 or 14, it's very likely that you are not struggle with the addiction in the same way as someone who started at four to escape reality with dissociation. So yes, both things are true and it depends on who you are and where, you're, where you come from. Now the question is, would you call a porn addict an addict since they really seem to kind of get better? And I would say that um, you, you will always need to watch out for what happens when you're under stress or feeling anxious or alone, that since you have learned to default to a compulsive behavior, that that idea that that might make you feel better will always be there. And so you're going to have to look out for spending and gambling and gaming and eating and all those other compulsive behaviors that your brain might convince you will make you feel better, maybe when you have a baby or maybe when you're older, you know. So, but it is true that porn addicts do have, what, if you can call it that, an easier time over time than uh, a regular sex addict. There's a continuation to this, and I want to jump in. So um, I guess if I come to a point where I can put in the work now, work hard to recover, and then not have to work to recover the rest of my life, and I'm going to share what, um, what happens for me. is like I had to work really hard early on on recovery, I, and then it became part of my – I mean, what does that mean to work for hard? For me, I worked hard. I was like at meetings you know, twice a day, and I, you know, I mean, I did – like I was reading my big book. I was, you know, calling my sponsor. I did like everything I needed to do, but I had all this time because like, you know, I was acting out all the time. And so then all of a sudden I had time. So like I could fill it with different things. And initially I chose to fill it with recovery things. And then I learned, you know, then I lived in Michigan. We went cross, I had a group of friends that were in recovery. We went cross country skiing and then we went into, you know, I did other things that were still around recovery. Grew out of it. Exactly, exactly. But then my life grew out of that. And like the 12 steps, the especially, you know, 10, 11, and 12, the, re, the maintenance steps are so part of me, you know, that I don't have to work so hard at it. I still choose to do recovery things. I do this kind of stuff, but I still go to meetings for myself um, because 
I want Patience. to, yeah, I want, I want the insurance policy that I don't have to go back to the hell that I had quite frankly. And yeah, you know, I've seen too many people that relapsed or thought, Oh, I got recovery now. So for me, you know, like the semantics that you talked about, it's like, I would let that go for now. Just, just keep doing what you need to do for now and see where you go. You may choose at some point to go, you know, this, this is a fit for me. And I've um, found a place that feels safe that I, you know, I can uh, find the healthy balance of working on recovery, but also having a life. I want to say something, actually, I want to, we're, we're at time, so I wanted to say something to all of you. Um, I can't tell you how incredibly grateful and lucky I am to have this woman to work with. Oh. Um, I've known Tammy for almost 20, or up to 15 years or something like that, and it is such a privilege to work, and we, we're not in the same state, we barely see each other, but except here, I think we see each other every week, but but your integrity, your commitment, your kindness. Um, they don't know, but I know how many hours you put aside to just talk to some upset wife or some guy who's struggling on your own time just because you want to help. And that doesn't come with a job. That comes with the soul and heart that you have. So I just really want to thank you, Tammy, because you make my life much better and all these people as well, for sure. Don't say anything. Tammy says thank you. Okay, we love you guys. Um, you know where to find us, Sex and Relationship Healing. Please call us, reach out. We're glad to help. And yes, it is the truth. Tammy is amazingly helpful. Y'all have a good night. Thank Bye you. for now. Thanks, Tam. Bye.